All right, good morning, folks. Let's uh, open our hymn, uh, hymn book, or sheets, uh, hymn number 18. Let's sing Dwelling in Beulah Land. All right, hymn number 18, Dwelling in Beulah Land. Far away the noise that strikes upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth be set on every hand. Doubt and fears and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of it shall move. Just over in the glory land, 15, song number 15, I have a home prepared where the saints abide, just over in the glory land. Uh -huh. All right, I have a home prepared where the saints abide. Just over in the glory land, and I long to be by my Savior's side. Just over in the glory land, on the cross now. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory. On the cars now, just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host of just over in the glory land. Amen. Great.
great singing, folks. And it's our, our last hymn will be um, uh, hymn number 14, Till the Storm Passes By. All right, it's a great song. All right, it's, uh, it's an old hymn. Okay, in the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face. Let's keep it. Yeah. In the dark of the midnight. All right, let's do it again. Okay. In the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face. While the storm falls about me. And there's no hiding place May the crash of the thunder Precious Lord, hear my cry Keep me safe Till the storm passes by Till the storm passes over Till the thunder sounds no more Till the clouds roll forever from the sky, hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy head. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Many times Satan whispered, there is no need to try, for there's no of sorrow, there's no hope by and by, but I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storms never darken the skies. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds Skies. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy head. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Amen. Amen. Great seeing you today. Hope that you've uh, been blessed already to be in the Lord's house today. We're so excited to always have our summer, uh, I'll keep wanting to say afternoon service, but our 11 o'clock service. And as I mentioned this morning, Pash has been away, so I'll be in prayer for him as he's just uh, not feeling well. Uh, but thankfully, we're grateful today that Brother Josh Wong is uh, uh, planned to preach for us today. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Josh if you come and open the word for us this morning. Thank you, Pastor Matt, and uh, praise God for such a nice day today, right? It's, uh, it's been a beautiful day so far, and uh, we're blessed to be in the house of the Lord. And so, try to be loud for you guys so you guys can hear, but um, let's uh, open our Bibles and start reading in Genesis chapter 37, and then we'll pray. So we're going to read Genesis chapter 37, and I'm going to start in verse 1. And, and Jacob dwelt in a land where... And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. 
And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him. And he said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying. And his brethren went to feed the flocks of their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send uh, thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I. Let's stop and uh, take a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much again for today. And uh, please use this time that we can hear your word, that it can be precise, Lord, and that can work in our hearts, Lord, and encourage us to be close to you. And for us as Christians, that we would grow in faith and work the works that you would have us to do. And for anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord Jesus, as their personal Savior, I pray, Lord, that you touch their heart in a special way this morning, that they will become a child of yours, that they would be saved and they would know you and they'd have a home forever with you in heaven. And we thank you, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, I started reading here in Genesis 37. And isn't it amazing how God used a great story, like the story of Joseph and the history of Jacob, to teach us such important lessons about faith and about perseverance and strength? And I started in chapter 37 because I wanted you guys to see and I wanted to remind us all that Joseph's brothers had a lot against them. They had a lot of stuff going on. Their family had a lot of turmoil and a lot of tragedy and a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. So if we're if we're too hard on Joseph's brothers, looking at this, we can see that there was a reason that they also felt a lot of pain and anger and frustration. Not to say that they're excused for it, but they were. They were feeling that pain and frustration and they didn't have the right source to be able to help them to get through it. But let's go back into chapter um, 37. We see at the beginning of the chapter that Joseph is favorited uh, by his father, Jacob. And if we look into verse 2, we see that um, Jacob has his 17-year-old son, Joseph, and he has his, uh, his other sons, his other 10 sons, And Joseph brings back an evil report. And then in verse 3, we see that now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. This is important because Jacob really loved Joseph. He put him on a pedestal above his brothers because he was the son of his old age, and he was the son of Rachel, the, the wife that he loved. But it wasn't good for Joseph's brothers, and it wasn't right that Joseph was lifted on such a pedestal because it put a lot of animosity in the family. And I'd like to share four instances and four circumstances in Joseph's life that caused um, him to be able to walk in faith and helped him to walk with God throughout the circumstances that he faced. I'd also like to share how Jesus went through very similar, four similar circumstances to Joseph. And in those circumstances, he also was close with God and he accomplished the will of God the Father. And so let's start with Joseph. And the first thing we see is that he is sold as a slave. And so we've seen already in these verses that Joseph's brothers were really angry with him. They were mad that he had this coat of many colors, that he was favored. They were angry that he was going to be having these dreams. And these dreams that he was going to have were going to be of them obeying and bowing to him. And his brothers really didn't like that. They were older than him. You know, they probably thought they were wiser than him. But God had a reason for these dreams, and God gave Joseph these dreams. And I'm going to look back into that a little bit later on. But the first thing that we see is that because of all of this, Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. If we look at chapter 37 of uh, Genesis, if we go from uh, a little summary, verses 1 to 14, or 1 to 13 and 14, are talking about Joseph and why his brothers hate him. And then when we look down further into verses 18 to 23, we see the opportunity for them to strike back at Joseph for all the anger that they had. Or 18 to uh, 28, sorry, verses 18 to 28. And that's when they sell him into slavery. And then in verses 31 to 38, we see that they continue and go further. Not only do they fall into sin and they they, uh, sell Joseph into slavery, now they have to continue in that path because they need to cover up their deception. So they lie to their father and tell him that Joseph is dead. And so this is what we see in these these verses. For sake of time, I'm not going to go through every verse. But um, let's just look at one verse here. 
And it says in verse 18, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. So this was their plan that they were going to kill Joseph. And thank God they ended up selling him into slavery and not killing him because of his brother Simeon. But that's the first thing I want us to notice. I'm going to go through four things. So Joseph is sold. The second thing that we see is that Joseph is accused. So after he ends up being sold into slavery and he ends up in uh, Pharaoh's, um, in Egypt with Pharaoh's officer uh, Potiphar, we see that Joseph has a chance to continue to keep working and doing what's right. And he begins, begins to gain elevation with uh, Potiphar. He gets an opportunity that he is going to work in the house of Potiphar and he's going to become a leader in his house. But unfortunately for Joseph, his struggles have not ended yet. And we see that uh, Potiphar's wife ends up trying to seduce Joseph because he is such a good man and he is very well favored. And so it's unfortunate, but she tries to seduce him day by day and she keeps trying to get Joseph to be with her. And this is the time when he ends up getting accused because on the last of her accusations, she, uh, on the last of her seductions, she accuses Joseph because he flees and he tries to get away. And when he flees, she keeps his clothing with him and she accuses him to her husband Potiphar. So the husband comes home and Potiphar is very, very angry to hear that Joseph had tried to attack his wife. And so as a, as a husband, he tries to protect her and he throws Joseph into prison. So now we've seen that Joseph is sold and we've seen that Joseph is now accused unrightly. He was unjustly accused. The next thing that we see also that leads into is that Joseph is forgotten. So he's left in this prison. Can you imagine what it's like to be tossed into a prison? It's, it's horrible. It's, it's, it's the worst that could happen. He's thrown into this prison and yet he still tries to do what's right. And yet he has a heart for other people. But in the prison, two people come into his uh, prison cells with him, and it's the chief butler and the chief baker. And both men have very troubling dreams, and Joseph helps them to interpret those dreams. And when he interprets the dreams for them, he asks them to remember him, specifically the butler. He says, remember me when you go back to Pharaoh, because the dream that he had was going to be that the butler was going to go back and become in his rightful position again. And so he the butler goes to the, his position again with Pharaoh and he gets called out to, to become his cupbearer again, but he forgets about Joseph. How sad. Joseph's been already sold. He's been accused. And now he's been forgotten in a place where he has nothing. And now he's getting forgotten. When he has a chance to, to make what's right, he asks for help and nobody helps him. Thank God that's not where it ends because not only is Joseph sold, accused, and forgotten, but he is also exonerated. And we see that through this story, Joseph had a, a tie-in with dreams. And a dream is such a fitting way that he ends up getting rescued out of this, um, out of this prison because Joseph's, uh, Joseph's dreams were interpreted by God. And, and he had the strength that God gave him to interpret those dreams so that he could eventually get out of this bondage. And God did not forget Joseph. And so we see that uh, Pharaoh wakes up one day and he has a really bad dream. And he is just looking for help. He goes to all of his uh, entourage and he gets all of his wise men and all of his sorcerers and he asks them can you interpret this dream can you help me and of course at this time the butler has now been brought to his position and he's probably holding a cup of joe a cup of coffee for uh for pharaoh and he's saying here you go pharaoh here's your drink and he says you know what oh my goodness i forgot i forgot about joseph i know my faults this day i forgot that there was a man who can interpret dreams he told me that i was going to get out of being Sorry. He told me that I was going to get out of being um, in prison. Thank you, Pastor Matt. He told me that I was going to get out of being in prison. And I, I was supposed to tell you about him. He told me about the dream. And he told about the baker as well. And the baker you hung and me, you brought back to my position. So his interpretation of the dreams is right. And so now we've seen that Joseph is sold. He's been accused. He's been forgotten. And now he's going to be exonerated because Joseph gets taken out of the prison. And he tells Pharaoh his dream. And he, uh, he interprets the dream for Pharaoh. And the wisdom that he is given is given by God. And by that wisdom, Pharaoh ends up making him the second ruler in all of Egypt. And the fact that he has gone from nothing, but he still was faithful to God, God saw him and he pulls him and he lifts him up. And he brings him to a position where he's second in the land of Egypt. And God, God does not forget about us when we are in struggles. He knows what we're going through and he's going to help us through. We just have to trust him. And so we've seen, amen, amen. So we've seen that he's done all these things in Joseph's life. He was sold, accused, forgotten, and exonerated. But not only that, 
Joseph had a point where he was forgiven, he was cleared, because his brothers ended up coming to him. The, the, the famine that I was talking to you guys about, the fact that Pharaoh said that there was going to, had this bad dream and Joseph interpreted the dream. The dream was that Pharaoh was going to have to take seven years of famine and have seven bad years following seven great years of plenty. There was going to be so much plenty that they didn't know what to do with it. But because of Joseph, they ended up saving that seven years of plenty. And when the famine came, the famine was very, very sore. If we look into Genesis chapter uh, 40, uh, sorry, 40 and 41, we see the dreams of Pharaoh. And as we see that there was a seven years, it was so bad that it ended up that all the world, everywhere, all the lands were going to be having this famine. And so guess what? Guess about the family that had forgotten about him. Guess, guess about Canaan, back where Joseph was with his brothers, who when they lied about him being sold, they were going to have to end up coming to Pharaoh and coming to Egypt to ask for bread because they were going to die if they didn't have food. And so guess who was leading the, the handing out and the distributing of the food? It was Joseph. And isn't that amazing that God flipped the script on them? And Joseph's brothers, when they came to him, they ended up falling and prostrating themselves before Joseph, begging for food. And it's exactly as the dream that Joseph said. So we see one part of his exoneration, that he was let go, he was cleared of the guilt. And the reason why I use the term exonerated, it's not just I want to use a big word, it's because it's very specific for the case of Joseph. With exoneration, or to be exonerated, it's a legal term, a term used in court, that talks about being completely free. Um, when we're accused of stuff, by the devil, by ourselves, by unjust circumstances, God can exonerate us from those circumstances. And in Joseph's life, he was completely cleared from the, just, the, the unjust punishment that he was given. At that time, God also let him be a method of forgiveness to his brothers. And we see in chapter uh, Genesis chapter 43, I'm trying not to take too much time to go into all the verses, but in Genesis 43, we see that um, Joseph's brothers come and they, they ask forgiveness from him. He, he cries with them and they ask forgiveness. And he says, you know what? God sent me ahead of you. It was God's plan. Even though you didn't have a good plan, God's plan was to help and to use it. And so now we've seen that Joseph was sold, he was accused, he was forgotten, and he was exonerated. But I also said that we were going to look at the life of Jesus because in Jesus' life, he also went through those similar circumstances as Joseph. And so first off, Jesus was also sold. He was sold out by one of his closest to him, Judas Iscariot. And Judas was one of his disciples, person who should have loved Jesus. But Jesus, uh, Judas sold him out for a mere t uh, 30 pieces of silver. And if we turn quickly into Matthew chapter 26, so you can turn into Matthew chapter 26, we can see where Jesus was sold. And verse 14, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, what will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenant with him for 30 pieces of silver. So we see that Jesus was also sold. He was sold as if he were a slave. 30 pieces of silver was a price of a slave, a, a Jewish slave. He wasn't even given a royal uh, bounty. He was given only the price of a slave. That's how much or how little the Pharisees thought Jesus was worth. And it's unfortunate. But Jesus was not also only sold. Jesus was also accused, just like Joseph. And the Pharisees took every opportunity to accuse Jesus. They accused him of healing on the Sabbath, that it was unlawful. They accused him of casting out devils by the prince of the devils in Matthew 12, 24. They accused him of blasphemy. Can you imagine? They accused the Lord of all creation of blasphemy. That in itself is blasphemy for, for them to do that. There was a small um, quote I'd like to read really quick that I read when I was doing a Bible study. And I like it because it talks about Jesus and the way that the Pharisees and the bad people were trying to judge him. And so I'll read up this paraphrase that I wrote. As Jesus grew into a man, many people marveled at who he was. Others became jealous, wanting his fame and hating his accurate judgment of their lack of character. They saw that he, if he should continue in his miracles, one day all the people would follow him, upsetting their social order and diverting funds out of their pockets. The more good Jesus did, healing the sick on the Sabbath, forgiving the adulteress caught in adultery, um, causing the blind to see and the deaf to hear, the more he distanced himself from the self-righteous, power-driven, money-hungry Pharisees and chief, chief priests. They wanted superficial piety and mindless follower devotion, and he brought justice, grace, and truth. 
They wanted to be worshipped. He taught true worship from the heart. They made impossibly high ideals, burdens for others to carry that they wouldn't lift, while Jesus lifted up the humble and gave strength to the weak. Matthew 11.28 speaks of this. And let's take a look at Matthew 11.28. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And it talks about how much Jesus loves us. In Matthew 11, verse 28, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that beautiful? That's the way that the Lord was. And that's why they hated him so much. So Jesus was sold, just like Joseph. He was also accused. Not only that, Jesus was also forgotten. Do you guys remember in the temple when Jesus was talking with some of the scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law? And his parents left him there for several days. Can you, can you imagine being left somewhere if you were a child? Imagine being left in a temple or left at church. Imagine you were left at church and nobody came to pick you up for three days. Wouldn't that be horrible? Wouldn't that be so bad? It would be really bad. Or even an adult. Imagine we, we came to church and the person who's going to give us a ride, they ended up leaving and not coming back until next week. That would be just just horrible. It would not be good. And so we see that Jesus was also forgotten. And he wasn't just forgotten for a time period. He was forgotten throughout his life. So from when he was young, he was forgotten as a child. But what about when Peter was told by Jesus that he was going to deny him three times? Peter said, no, Lord, no, Lord, I'll never deny you. Even if I die, I'll never deny you. And Jesus said, will you really? Before the cock crows, you will deny me thrice. You'll deny me three times. And Peter only remembered his denial of Jesus when Jesus looked at him from the judgment hall. And at at the time that Jesus looked at him, the cock crew. And Peter remembered the Lord. He didn't forget, but he remembered after the fact. If this was the only time that Jesus had forgotten, that would be bad enough too. But after Jesus even suffered all the pain he was going to suffer and die on the cross and be risen again, even in that time, before he went to see his disciples, their lack of faith was so astounding, they forgot that Jesus had died and that he told them for years. All his preaching, he kept telling them, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And they all forgot and became sad because they thought that their their, their king was dead. Their ruler was was not going to be really the God who he said he was. They, They didn't have enough faith. But thank God that even though Jesus was forgotten in all those circumstances, he too was exonerated, just like Joseph. And we see that all the the charges laid against him were proved to be nothing more than fake charges. And we see him when we look into chapter 27 of Matthew, when Jesus rises again. Sorry, this, uh, or 28, sorry, the resurrection of Christ. My paper is slipping here. Um, So in in verse uh, 6 we see, He is not here, for he is risen. So Matthew 28, verse 6. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And verse 7, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Isn't that amazing? After his disciples had forgotten about him, Jesus did not forget about them. When he was exonerated, when he proved that he was God by raising from the dead, his first thought was to think of how he was going to help his disciples. And he wanted to help his disciples so that they would be able to come back to faith in him. So now we've seen that Jesus and Joseph both went through the same circumstances. They were both sold, they were both accused, they were both forgotten, and they were both exonerated. But what about us? How does that apply to our lives today? How can we draw something from these messages to give us hope today? Well, I'd like to submit to you guys today that we can apply these principles in our lives by taking a deeper look at Joseph and a deeper look at Jesus. Although we may feel like we're sold, we are safe in God's hands. Looking back into the life of Joseph, we see that despite his circumstances, God was with him. We see that he was never abandoned by the Lord, and that we are always safe in God's hands when we trust in the Lord and we do what's right. We see that with his brothers, when they sold him into slavery, the Lord was still with him. It's so sad that he had to be alone in the sense of humanly speaking, but he was not alone 
because he was truly with God and God was with him. If we look into our verses of Genesis that we've read, and I skipped through a little bit to show you guys, but I wanted to focus now and give the application to give a little more time. We can look into where Joseph was indeed with the Lord. And so one example there we have is when we look and we see him tested by adversity going into office, uh, the office of becoming, working for Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's uh, officer, Potiphar. And so we look and we see in verse chapter 5, actually let's go a little earlier, in verse chapter 3. Actually, no, sorry, even verse chapter 2. So this shows how much God is actually with Joseph. He, he's with him throughout the way, but let's look in verse chapter 2. And the Lord was with Joseph. Isn't that amazing? God was with Joseph in his adversity. And he was a prosperous man. And what about verse 3? And the Lord made him all that he did to prosper in his hand. And verse 4, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and made him overseer of all his house, and all that he put his hand under. And verse 5, And it came to pass from that time that he made him overseer in his house over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So God was always with Joseph. If we look a little bit further down, we also see that God was with Joseph when he was ended up in the prison. When he goes into the prison, he is forgotten. So when we feel sold, we're safe in God's hands, just like Joseph was. But when we're uh, accused and we're put into a place where we're left in a prison that we feel, whether it's a prison of shame, whether it's, whether it's a, a position that we feel we're unjustly given, when people forget about us, God doesn't forget about us. In verse 21 of chapter 39, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Isn't that amazing? God didn't forget about Joseph. And he doesn't forget about us. Whatever we're going through, we can always trust and rely on God. And it's a great example that we can look at Joseph's life and Jesus' life. Because even in Jesus' life, when he was accused, his God didn't forget about him. God still provided for Jesus, that he was, had the oil of gladness above his fellows. He still had joy, even though he was going to suffer. And now if we look further into Joseph's life, we can see that even though we feel accused, we're safe in God's purpose. So with Joseph, God had a, a master plan. Remember how I told you at the end of, of the Genesis that um, he was going to save his brothers and he was going to save all of Egypt? God has a master plan for us. He has a plan that is good and he has a plan that is meant so like we've sang this morning and that we sing in church that God is going to work, that God is going to give us strength, that we're going to have um, ability from him as of water flowing out of us. But God can only give us that strength if we're close to him, if we're with him. It's not our strength. It's not our strength to preach. It's not our strength to pray or to sing or to serve, but it's God's strength that he gives us. But no matter what, as long as we're in God's purpose, God will protect us and he'll take care of us, even if we're put into a position of prison. I don't mean to tell you guys a prosperity gospel, that God will uh, make you abandon all of your pain and suffering, that you'll go through life and you'll have it uh, cloud nine. No, I don't want to tell you that because it's not true. And God doesn't want that for you. He wants to grow us in our faith through our adversities and through our struggles. But he'll use those struggles and he'll help us through them. And so looking further, we see that even if we feel sold, we're safe in God's hands. Even if we're accused, we're safe in God's purpose. Even if we're forgotten, we are safe in God's memory. And if we take a look at the life of Jesus, he was forgotten and left to die. His disciples betrayed him by running away. They didn't stay. They didn't stick around. And Jesus had to go to the cross alone. When he was in Gethsemane, they fell asleep and couldn't even pray with him for one hour. But Jesus was not alone because he went to the Father. And he drew strength from God. The same way we can draw strength from God today. And the same way in Joseph's life, even when he was forgotten, he still had a good character. Let's take a look again at how he had a good character. So in Joseph's life, he sees when, in verse 6, chapter 40 and verse 6, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And this is speaking of the butler and the, and the baker. Can you imagine Joseph being in this prison, being sold from his family, being sent away, being accused of all this evil stuff, and now he's in a prison, and he could be despairing. He could be sad. He could be. He should be the one who is asking for help and looking for someone to help him. But what is the first thing he does? 
he looks and sees the sad countenance of those around him. And I'd like to, to submit today that when we're in a position where we're hurting and we're in a lot of pain, God will give us the strength to get out of it. I'm not saying that it's not going to hurt. But when we're in that pain, God wants us to look on the needs of others and look on the pain in others so that we can actually forget about that pain, so that we can put God first and, and God will use that pain and, and the suffering that we go through and the suffering that we see in others to help us to get to where we need to go. And he looked and he saw that they were sad and he wanted to help them. And isn't it funny that that same butler who he looked out for was the one who came back and said, you know what, Pharaoh, this man, Joseph, he was a good man. He helped me and he can help you too. Don't be surprised that God is going to put across your path somebody that you don't think is the person that you need to be helping. That you are in so much pain and suffering at times that you feel like God should be helping you and not this person. This person, may, you may feel like they don't deserve the help. But you know what? What if God is sending that person to you so that that person can be your method of deliverance? And what if your lifeline is to not think of yourself, but to put God first and to, to help someone else in need? I, I believe that that's what God would do. I, I believe that's the heart of the Lord because he loves every person who's in pain. And just because we're in pain doesn't mean someone else is not in pain. It should be that when we feel pain, we should relate to other people and say, you know what? I've gone through suffering. I've hurt. But I know you've hurt too. And Jesus will help you through that hurt. And he'll give you strength. And he does. He always does. So we see that we're safe in God's hands, even if we feel sold. We see that even if we're accused, we're safe in God's purpose. And we see that even if we're fought, forgotten, we are safe in God's memory. I'd like to also let you guys think about something now too. That even if we're in a position where we need to be exonerated, that we've been left to dry and we need someone to step in, we are always safe in God's forgiveness. Always. And to be honest, we're all sinners. God says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, there's times when we've been in a position that was unfair. Maybe at work. Maybe with our friends. Maybe here at church. That we've been judged or thought of less than what God knows that we are in our hearts. And not that we're trying to be proud because God lives up the humble. But God sees those circumstances when we've been cheated, when things haven't been right, when, when we've been left to the side and no one remembers us. But I'd like to tell you guys that even though we feel that way, God and his forgiveness and his exoneration, the way that he will clear us of guilt, is absolute. Whether or not we see it in this life, like there was in the circumstance of Joseph, or whether we have to wait until we get to heaven one day, God will clear us. And God promises that if we've asked forgiveness for our sins, that he has cleared us for once and for all, for all the guilt that we've done, for all the sin that we've done. And he'll clear us for all the times that someone accused us wrongly, for all the times that someone cheated us, for all the times that we were left in a corner alone. He will be there for us, and he will provide a place of everlasting joy. That He'll wipe away all our tears in that day, and we'll be there in, in heaven with him for all of eternity. So we see that God exonerates us. We're always safe in God's forgiveness. And I wanted us to remember this in, a, in an easy way. I like to use a acronyms because for me, I, I forget stuff pretty easily. So for the acronym, I wanted to use the word safe because we're always safe with God. So the first letter of each is the same letters that we see in these um, instances. So first it's S for we're, even if we feel sold. And the second is A. So even if we feel accused. The third is the F, even if we feel forgotten. And most importantly, if we need to be cleared or exonerated, God is always with us. We are always safe in God's hands. And so, as, as a Christian, I'd like to take the second now to remind us that Christians, yes, we're in a position that we've already been forgiven. Thank God that we've been forgiven. But what does that mean we should do now that we're forgiven? And think about it for a second. Think about it for a second. And for anyone here, if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, who's never actually asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins, do you know that God wants to forgive every single one of our sins, all of them? He wants us to all go to heaven one day. He's not willing that any should perish. Think about it for a minute, that the God of eternity went through being sold, accused, forgotten, and having to be cleared when he was guiltless, all just because he loved us, and all just because he wants us to have that forgiveness. Okay, so last couple of passages. Thank you for being patient with me. And let's look back into Matthew eleven twenty eight, And I want to talk again to 
anyone who's a Christian here. Let's look into Matthew 11 and verse 28. And so as I go to Matthew 11, it's that same passage that I told you about Jesus. And I'll read it again, starting at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christians, isn't that amazing that God, the God of all, all eternity, would want to take our burdens from us, would want to give us rest? You know, when we're doing what's right and we feel like we're struggling, God can give us a rest. But I'd like to challenge us today too. And this is our last set of verses. But we're going to look into Isaiah because sometimes we're not like Joseph. Sometimes we've done wrong. So let's turn in our, in our Bibles to Isaiah for our last passage. Isaiah 57. And Isaiah 57 verse 1 says, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace, they shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Do you notice I said his uprightness? In this passage we see a very sad judgment on the nation of Israel for walking away from God and thinking that their outer appearance of their works was enough to satisfy God and that God didn't look on their hearts. And we know, even as we learned in Sunday school about David, that God does not look on the outside. God looks on the heart. And he sees our hearts. He knows if we're right with him. But Christians today, challenges for us. Are we walking with God in faith? Are we unlightening the burdens of others? Are we trusting in him or are we trying to do things in our own strength? I don't mean to claim anyone here is an overt evil sinner who's going and doing all kinds of evil and I pray that that never happens for us. But even if we just do the motions of being at church, even if we just try to do the best we can do in our own strength, it's not pleasing to God. Let me, let me continue to read in the verses. And in verse, let's see here, verse, verse 11. And of whom hast thou been afraid or feared, that thou hast lied, and hast not remembered me, nor laid it to thy heart? Have not I held my peace, even of old, and thou feared me not? Verse 12. I will declare thy righteousness and thy works, for they shall not profit thee. Now, I said this is for Christians, but it applies for Christians and for anyone who doesn't know Jesus. That our works will not profit us. No matter what we do, whether good or whether just trying to do the status quo, it's not, it's not enough in the eyes of the Lord. And does, what does that mean? We, we can't do any better. That's all the best we can do, right? No. In our own strength, the best we can do is like filthy rags. But God gives us strength to do things not in our own strength. And that's why we see in verse 13. When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee, but the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them. But he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. As I was reading in Matthew about Jesus, that he wants us to lift up the burdens. Christians, our job is to walk in faith with God and to take step by step in his strength. Thank God it's not our ability. It's his ability that gives us the, the power to do what's right. As long as we're praying and we confess our sins and we come to him day by day, he will give us the strength to do mighty and amazing things that we don't know. And he'll do more than that. And in verse 14, And shall say, Cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. God wants us to help unlift the burdens of others. As Christians, our job is, is to be someone who steps in and, and fills the gap. For thus saith the high and lofty one, this God, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Contrite, us being sad and, and being sorry about our sin. And humble spirit that we don't 
think that we are able to do it, but he is able to do it. Just like with Joseph. Isn't it funny how Joseph, who was so humble, was lifted to be one of the highest men? And to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You know, as Christians, when we see people who have a humble heart, someone who's hurting, or someone who knows that they've done wrong and they need forgiveness, God made it our job to tell them that Jesus Christ died for their sins. It may be scary for us to do, but how much scarier was it for Jesus to go to the cross? How much scarier was it for him to pay the penalty for us? The least we can do is help to unlighten those burdens. That's his will for us. We know that telling the truth about Jesus to our friends, our family, our coworkers is always the will of God. Do we want to be in the will of God, Christians? Yes, we do. Let's, let's, let's keep fighting to do that. And God will be the one to give the increase. God will be the one to bring people to church. God will bring people to be saved. It's not us. But don't we want to be part of that? And I know we do. I know our church does. And I thank God for our church. Let's keep reading as we finish up. For I will not contend forever, neither will I always be wroth. For the spirit should fail before me, and the souls which I have made. God made all of us. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth, and smote him. I hid me and was wroth, and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. That's us, without Jesus or in our own strength. I have seen his ways and will heal him. This is the mercy of God. This is the grace of God in our lives. The same mercy and grace that was sent to Joseph, the same mercy and grace that was sent to Jesus so that he could accomplish amazing things for us, that he could die and raise again from the dead because he was God, that same power is available for us today. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. God will comfort us in our distress. I will create the fruit of the lips. God will. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal. One last challenge. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much today that we could have some time to come together and see your word and see how powerful of a God you are, a God of forgiveness, a God who sees us when we're sold, sees us when we're accused, forgotten, and when we need to be exonerated. But Lord, I pray now that if there's anyone here who's in a position where they need to be forgiven, Lord, oh Lord, work in their heart because only you can work to forgive them. Whether they're a Christian and they know you, Lord, or they're not a Christian, your love is the same and your love is eternal. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I know you want that for everyone here. And Lord, I pray that if anyone's here that doesn't have that, let them ask of you, because you've already finished that work, and it's there for them. And let them grow in grace, and grow in the knowledge of you, and let them walk by faith day by day, and grow this church, Lord, and help us. Give us a fire to serve you with all we are, with all our strength. Not, not that we have to do it in our own strength, but to give all that we have into your hands, Lord to humble ourselves and say, Lord, we're unworthy and unable, but you are able. And for our, us as Christians, Lord, help us and thank you, Lord, that you've given us a strength to come here today to serve you and that we do serve you, Lord, and you see our hearts. And I know, Lord, as you look on the hearts of the Christians here, that you want to encourage these Christians to love you and serve you and to keep going in your ways. Lord, thank you for the strength in, in your abilities, Lord, not in ours. And we thank you for all these things, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much. You're